last lecture was uh, about image warping. So let's let us recall the problem. So we have an input image and we want to apply a geometrical transformation, so a deformation of the space. And that has two components. One is the working function that tells you every coordinate in the output where it is coming from in the input. The other one is the interpolation function. So once I know which coordinate I want to interpolate at the input, I need to somehow figure out what is the, the value there. Uh, this interpolation function was what we saw last uh, in the last session. Okay, so then uh, we have here an example of, of a spatial deformation that we want to apply. So here you see uh, what we have at the beginning. So this is our input image. This is what we have, what we want to, to have at the end, where the, uh, these towers uh, are straight rather than pointing to a point very high in the sky. So, what are you talking about? Hola, ¿cómo te llamas? Ana, qué bonito nombre. Ah, que sí. So, so this is uh, what we want to have. So we have some input coordinates that are uh, yeah, located here. And this is at the input. And then these coordinates, we want them to be at these locations at the output. And we saw last day how to do that through this uh, matrix H. That was a, a two-dimensional. It, it is a two-dimensional uh, coordinate transformation. And, and then what we will see today, and what we saw at the end, is that uh, despite all the all the sophistication, it is not too complicated. But this zero inverse seems to be a, a bit impressive. But uh, it's, Despite this, uh, this sophistication, we were not able to correct it uh, completely. So this is what we have at the end. So we started at the red lines. So the, the towers were aligned with the red lines. We want them to become blue so that this point goes to here. And we see that it only is it is only able of going halfway, so it is only able to go from this point. Uh, actually, it goes back, so this this tower goes back. This one goes a little bit of uh, in the direction that we want it, but but we don't succeed fully succeed. Okay, so let's see today if we can do uh, a better job. So yeah, we were seeing also that uh, these 2D transformations could be understood, all of them could be understood as a rotation, then, uh, then uh, a scaling, and then uh, another rotation. Actually, I explained to you the, the SPD uh, the composition, and in the sizes of the, the composition, they made a mistake. So let me see if I can find easily. This is the one. So what is the SPD? So I made a mistake. It is a very little mistake. It doesn't have, it doesn't uh, prevent the, the full understanding of what we were saying. But, so the small mistake is that this is not this is not n, this is m, but that's it. So yeah, this is a basis of the role uh, of the matrix 
uh, of the row vector surveying, this is a basis of the column vector surveying for the opposite. It doesn't matter. So, but they have to be complete. It's not N and N. Okay, then let's see uh, our better job today. So, the problem is that this perspective transformation, what we have in this image, is a perspective transformation. So, you can see that these powers, they seem to join very, uh, at a point that is very high in the sky. Okay? So, this is a, a, an effect of the perspective. And the, this perspective transformation is modeled not as a 2D transformation, but as a 3D transformation. So we need a 3D description of the process to, to recover or to be able to undo the perspective. And for doing that, we will, we will make use of something that is called the homogeneous coordinates. Okay, so let's see what homogeneous coordinates are. So, uh, okay, so let's say that you have a coordinate x, y, and this is your coordinate r. Then uh, we will define r in homogeneous coordinates as something that is k x, k y, k. For any k, and I don't know if there is a constraint. I don't think that there is a constraint that this is positive, but let's make it positive. These are not completely sure, but it doesn't matter. So the thing is that uh, you can take any input coordinate, multiply by any scalar, and then. You, that is a, a, an homogeneous representation of this point, and in particular, one of them will be this one. So x, y, one. This is a, a an homogeneous representation of this one. And given a given a, an homogeneous coordinate, uh, what is the point in the space that you are pointing? To? Okay, so we are given this uh, homogeneous coordinate where it's pointing to. So it is, um, let's call it, let's call this R X, R Y. So the X component of, of this vector, the Y component of this vector, and the K component of this vector. So it is R X divided by R K, and then R Y divided by R K. So we are pointing to that point. This is a point in the space. That is, a, you take the last component, you divide the first two, and that is the coordinate you are pointing to. So that means that a given point here, this point here, can be represented in infinite ways by, by homogeneous components, by homogeneous coordinates. OK, so. This is what we have in the slide. So we will take the homogeneous coordinate of the xy point. So we have an xy point, and then we add an extra one. And, and this is just the, the homogeneous representation of the point we want to go. And, and the thing is that now our edge matrix will be multiplying 3D coordinates rather than or homogeneous coordinates. And we are transforming all these homogeneous coordinates into these other homogeneous coordinates. And now we have a 3D uh, representation. And how many how many numbers uh, do we have available? So how many did we have before? So for this 2D transformation, we had only four possible uh, degrees of freedom. So we had only four numbers to, to, to fiddle with. While now, because H is a, is a three times three matrix, now we have nine. So we have many more degrees of freedom. And maybe with these extra degrees of freedom, we, we are 
uh, we, we can uh, better align the, the, the two images that we want, the input and the output. Okay, so, uh, okay, so let's develop this model a, a bit more. So we have now our input coordinates that are the ones that uh, we have in the input space. We have the output coordinates that are the ones that we have in the output space. This case, for the moment, they are uh, unknown, so we don't know which is the k by which we are multiplying each one of the output coordinates, but uh, we will get rid of them later. And then uh, the generic equation is, is transforming every input coordinate into an output coordinate, and both coordinates are in homogeneous coordinates. Okay, good. And then uh, if we gather all the p equations coming from each one of the p pairs, then what we have is this matrix transformation. Okay, so let's solve for that matrix transformation. The first thing is that we want to get rid of the k. Okay, so th this is the, the same equation system that we had before. Okay, so just a reminder, this is this one. This is this one. Okay, so we have that equation system. And what we will do is to divide the first equation by the third one and the second equation by the third one. And then you, you see how we get rid of the k. So I said the k for every point, we don't know which one it is, but we don't care because we will divide by the third equation and then the k doesn't appear anymore. Okay, so uh, this is the division of this k, uh, one uh, first equation divided by third, and this is the division of second divided by, by third. And that has been another uh, another constraint that we have applied. That is that H33 we have fixed it to one. Okay, because otherwise it is. Uh, you remember before that I said we have infinite representations of, of a, the same point in homogeneous coordinates. If we don't fix anything, then we still have this infinite representation. So we have, we need to fix something, and we will fix this H33, and then and then that will uh, constrain the equation system to have a unique solution. Okay. Then um, we take this denominator, we move it to the left. We take this denominator, we move it to the left. And then we have these two sets of equations, and which are the nouns. The nouns are the h's. So these h coefficients are the ones we want to solve. So we move everything to one side. So, so we move all this right term to the left. So this is what we have. Uh, and then uh, you take the age out. Okay, so the age will be this vector. So it is all the announced that we don't have and the one that we have fixed. Okay. So the one that we have fixed. So for every pair of points, we have two equations. So one equation, uh, the two equations relate the x, y point in the input, the u, v point in the output. And yeah, so now we have an equation system that we can solve. Uh, yeah. If we gather all the equations from all the points, this is the, the system matrix that we have. And our equation is of the form a h equal uh, a times h equals zero. This is a, a zero vector. Okay? So this is not a scalar zero, but it is a, a vector full of zeros. Um, 
do we have in this equation system, do we have a, a, an independent term? Or is this an homogeneous equation system? Sorry? The last one. Yeah, the last multiplication, since we are multiplying by one, so this column here is the independent uh, term. Okay. Um, yeah. So now we can uh, uh, solve for the equation system, and the, the solution goes to the SPD decomposition again. So we have the U that is a square matrix, S that is a diagonal matrix, and V that is again uh, a square matrix. Um, and this S, uh, just a reminder, it is called the matrix of singular values. So they play the role a bit of the of the higher values. Uh, and we write the matrix V as a function of the columns. Okay, so this V, we have uh, P uh, columns. So this V1, V2 are the different, uh, the different, the different columns of, of the matrix V. So then, to solve the equation system, we find what is the singular value with the smaller uh, singular value. Okay. So we, among this, among this collection of numbers, we take the minimum. And let's say it is the number k. So the solution, this h that we are looking for, is the eigenvector, the corresponding, or not eigenvector, the corresponding column vector of the matrix V. So if this is the, the kth element in the singular value of the composition, it would be the kth column in the, in the matrix V. And, and then we put them back to the to the uh, age. So now here this this V column this V column here will have uh, nine components. So we distribute our nine components to form our matrix age. And then uh, this matrix age goes if you see age age goes from X to Y, okay, so we have we have an input image, all right. We have an output image, make the output red. So we have Y prime, and we are going from. We are going from an x coordinate that is x y. We are going to a y coordinate that is u v. And uh, to go in that direction, we have y is equal to a. Let's make it, let's make it uh, homogeneous. So in the output, in the output, in the output, we have the homogeneous coordinates of y is equal to a the homogeneous coordinate of x. So a goes in this direction. But we said uh, whenever we warp an image, we start always in the output. So I start here, and I want to find what is the point that I have to interpolate in the image. So to go in this other direction, I need the inverse of A. OK, so let's see what we have in the slide. What we have in the slide is that thing. So well, I prime has been called here J. So you take a, an homogeneous coordinate of J, you multiply by the inverse of, of H, 
that will give you point and then you evaluate this n is representing the, the neighborhood of, of this point but somehow you have to evaluate i uh, using this neighborhood uh, or, or, yeah, or normalization this is the normalization of neighborhood that is divided by the third one okay so forget about the neighborhood it is the normalization of neighborhood. So this will give me an homogeneous coordinate. And if I want to find what is the 2D coordinate it is pointing to, I have to simply divide by the third component, by the K component of the homogeneous coordinate. That will give me a point, and then I have to interpolate I at that fractional point. And that will give you the, the value of the output image at that location. And this is the same, but uh, now using words to we'll, we'll describe the process. I, this is the one we have described. So. And, and here is uh, some considerations about uh, image rotation. Uh, uh, depending on uh, these considerations apply in general to, to image warping. So the output space does not need to be uh, of the same size as the input space. And so let's say that we have this input image. So don't, don't pay attention to the, to the equations here. We, we will not uh, look at them. But when you rotate your image, part of your input image may go out of the, of the uh, output canvas, if you want. So let's say that the input canvas and the output canvas are of the same size. When you rotate the image, the input, part of the input goes out of the canvas. So you have two solutions there. So just leave it out. Okay, so um, uh, you don't reuse this information for anything else. The other one is uh, to make some working or to make some uh, the output canvas to, to be bigger. So I think we have here the, the different options. Yeah. So you could make the output canvas to be bigger so that it can hold the whole uh, uh, the whole uh, input image. And there will be regions that will be black anyway. So for instance, all this region here. Let me copy. Copy this. Based. So let's say that I keep the out the, the big output image. So there will be parts of this output image, all these parts. I don't have information to fill them. So they will be black, or they will, I, I will have to do something with those. And the same thing happens if, if you have a, a small canvas, output canvas. If you keep the small one for all these regions, you don't have information in the same here. Same there. So what do you do with those areas? So you can do two things. So one of them is to uh, leave them to zero. So I don't know what they are, so they are zero. The other one is to do something that is called working. Or rally, sorry, or rally. So wrapping is okay. So let, let's look at this. Let me see if we have a better drawing in the, in the slide. And otherwise, I will do my own drawing. Okay, so yeah, we have this one.
Yeah. So let me copy this one. So I will copy this. So what we are talking now is what to do with the with the regions for which I don't have information. So I can do two things. One is to leave them to zero. The other one is to, to do wrapping. And the wrapping is the four way. OK, so the wrapping is let us repeat this image as we do in the full image. So let's say that we have here, this is our image. So let us repeat it as we do, as we have in the Fourier transform. So for filling these values, all these values, for which I don't have any value in the input, what I do is to, okay, the image is repeated. So if, if you want to interpolate this point here, this point is coming in this copy is the equivalent of this one. It's the equivalent of this one. You see? And this point here, this point here, it is the equivalent of this one. So wrapping means whatever, whenever you have a coordinate that goes out of the input image on the left, so it goes this month on the left, you go to the other uh, border of the image and you go by the same amount. And then you take the coordinate from there. And the same happens here. So we go out by delta y in that direction. So we, we go from the lower border of the image and we go by delta y. And so this is a, a kind of way of solving the wrapping. So the wrapping, you can think of the wrapping also as making this image kind of toroidal. So this is the same as we were doing with the torus when thinking in the Fourier transform. So for instance, in this direction, if you bend the image to make a kind of cylinder, whenever you go out in one direction, you are coming in in the other. So if you go out in this direction, you are coming in in this one. And, and the same for the top and bottom. But uh, it is not the only way of handling how to repeat the images. And let's say that you have an image. Let's say that you have an image. So this is our input image. And somehow this input image has this shape. So this shape means it is a gradient of, of values. So that here we have high values and here we have low values. So something like let me look for a gradient so that we can intensity gradient. So something like this, okay? So it is, this is reverse, but it starts darker and then you go right, okay? And what is the problem of periodization with this image? It is that we are causing, so we are causing a discontinuity. So uh, actually this is very nice because we can copy. So, 
So you are creating a discontinuity at this point. We agree. So this continuity is, you know what it means in Fourier space. So Fourier space, what do you have? In, we have this continuity in real space. We have ringing in Fourier space. Okay, and, the, and the opposite, if we have a discontinuity in Fourier space, you have ringing in real space. So what is, uh, what is the solution to this? So instead of, instead of, um, of repeating in that way, so instead of periodizing in this way, periodize this one. So I put periodize in this other way. So instead of periodizing, uh, just repeating, I can periodize by middle. Okay, and the same in this in this point. So I can now take this one and repeat it there. And now there is no discontinuity. So if you look at the gray values, they are continuous. And these are the mirroring conditions or the boundary conditions. So how you periodize, how you how you treat the space out of your image, these are called the boundary conditions. Boundary conditions. And now we know we have periodic mirroring. There is another one that is mirroring and inverting the sign. Uh, if you think of them in terms of uh, equations, so periodic means the ringing and the location is periodic. Some period n and in, in x and y. So this is what the Fourier transform is doing. Uh, mirroring, I don't dare to mirroring is to come. So I hope minus half. So I'm, I'm explaining what is happening at the origin. That uh, there are another way of writing the same equation here and the other side and the other boundary. And the other possibility is this one. Those are the three possibilities that we have. Probably there are more, but these are the, the three uh, better now. There is a Okay, so yeah, so when it comes out of the image, when I have to interpolate at the location and we have information, this one's here. What do I do? I can uh, set them to zero. I don't have information there, so set them to zero. The other possibility is to do wrapping. And, and the wrapping means I have to take a decision from where to take that, those pixels. And I can take this decision by simply repeating my image, that is uh, making it periodic. And, and that is the assumption that the Fourier transform is doing, so it is not a terrible decision. And the other one is uh, to deal with these boundary conditions in, in a better way, just to avoid these continuities. So for instance, this one, this one is, is, is good. This is the one doing the mirroring I have explained. This one is mirroring, but also if you know that your image goes to zero, then you can apply this one because uh, you will not have uh, this continuity. 
Okay, good. And yeah, all these slides are explaining those concepts. I think in a bit more detail, and I don't want to enter into these details. Okay. But the idea is what to do when uh, when you have to uh, when you go out of your community. Okay, good. So uh, let's see some examples. Okay, so let's see. Uh, we have this, uh, let's apply an image rotation with interpolation. Yeah, actually, uh, we explain this idea of, of, the, of the perspective or, or the deformation matrix being three times three. Actually, that is the one, uh, we have not shown the results, but the results are the ones that you wanted to have. So you wanted to go from this original image to this one, to this one, and this H minus one that we had with three times three matrix is the one that succeeds uh, to do this. So it is the one that has been employed to, to make this transformation. Okay, so now let's see some example of the notation. So here we have uh, an input image, and then this is a rotated version of it with a nearest neighbor interpolation. And if you look at the windows, so uh, this is a zoom of this part. So we have rotated by 60 degrees, I don't know how many. But uh, if you look at the windows, you see a deletion. And you, you understand why. It is because of this uh, 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 overlapping high frequencies. And, and you can compute, so it, it is supposed that the big cubic interpolation is the best one. So you can compute what is the difference between nearest neighbor interpolation and big cubic and nearest neighbor interpolation and big linear. So you can see where the differences are. And as expected, they are in the lines of the high frequency details. So the high frequency details are the ones that are overlapping. And here we have B linear interpolation. Now the windows are better. You see. And B cubic interpolation. And for instance, here we can see B linear minus B cubic. So yeah, the main difference is seem to be here in this building. But yeah, we can see much of a difference there. Maybe big cubic is a bit better. Right? And now uh, you can be very creative with your space working. So, for instance, let's say that I want to simulate uh, an image with uh, an image with a, a mirror that is a, a spherical mirror. And actually, this. See if I can find very relatively easily uh, this device. This is a spherical mirror, spherical mirror for 360. Yeah. So here you have a kind of device. So you put a camera and you have a kind of ball that goes in front of the camera. So the camera is not pointing to the to the outward, but it is pointing to the to the to the to the middle. Okay, so it has the middle just in close uh, in front of the of the camera. You see it here actually. And then with this you are able to to record 360 degrees around the camera. So this is a, a trick to record, to have a, a wide angle camera. But okay, so let, let's let's try to simulate that. So let's try to simulate how you will see this image that we had at the beginning, this one, if you had a, one of these papers. And you have to figure out what is the, the spatial transformation, but the spatial transformation, you can see it's relatively simple. So you have to define a couple of, of maximum uh, radii. 
So for instance, here you have, uh, let us define rho zero as this thing. So it is the minimum between the number of rows and number of columns at the output and divided by two. And for the input, we define something similar, but now instead of the minimum, we take the maximum. And now, for each output pixel, I need to find what is the input pixel that I have to interpolate. Okay, so I take, what is the radius of the output pixel? Okay, so the radius is rho, I miss this one. This is assuming that the 0, 0, 14 is here. This at the middle, okay. So that is the origin. So we have uh, positive and negative rows. Then we compute what is the uh, couple of angles. So uh, this is this angle here. So this is just these two are the are the cylindrical coordinates of, of the output pixel. And this one somehow it is involving what is the maximum. So what is your what is your radius compared to your maximum radius that you have? So what you are somehow computing is where you are in the in the spherical middle. Uh, and then so we have now, so you start with R out C out, and now we have rho, theta, and phi. Now with phi we compute this D. So this this zero is fixed. So with with phi that is different for every input output point, it is uh, we compute d, and then with d and theta we compute what is the coordinate that we want to uh, evaluate. And so we have this transformation. You start with a, a, a point in the output and you go to a point in the input. This is equivalent to what we were doing before. What we were doing here with the h minus 1. Only that h minus 1 is a very easy transformation and now our transformation is much more sophisticated but otherwise it is the same. You start with the coordinate in the output and somehow you figure out what is the coordinate in the input that you want to interpolate. And you perform the interpolation and then this is what you want, what you get. And if you know how to go in one direction, if you invert that, that transformation, then you put down warpy. So let's say that you have a, a, an image recorded with this kind of cameras, and if you go in the other direction, then you can make it straight and go to the original image like this. So now we, we have a very powerful tool to deform a space. Okay, and they all go through this structure. So you need a function to deform a space, and this function to deform a space will tell you every output coordinate where it is coming from in the input. And, and then uh, you interpolate the input image at that location. And actually, there is a, another nice representation of that. So, I look at this in here. So, this deformation of space doesn't need to be uh, given by a closed form formula. So, you can have any deformation, any arbitrary deformation of the space. So, this deformation of the space would, take, would tell you how to take any point here and interpolate it in the output and, and the inverse, that is the inverse deformation of this as one, would tell you the opposite direction. Okay. So you can have uh, any arbitrary uh, deformation of the space. You need to find a, a way, a suitable way of, of expressing this deformation of the space, but uh, there are ways to do that. But this deformation of space uh, can, can be arbitrary. So it doesn't need to fall with it in any one of these uh, categories of rotation or uh, perspective or mid, uh, spherical mirrors. 
we can have more data. Any question? No. Okay, so let's make a break. The next lecture is about uh, denoising. And we will have two, a couple of lectures on denoising. One with uncorrelated noise, the other one with correlated noise. And uh, we have here a, a distinction of these two kinds of noises. So we have correlated noise. Uh, here we have possible sources. Those are not the only ones. But we have a, an electrical interference. For instance, it is relatively difficult, not, not anymore, because uh, now with digital uh, devices, this, this kind of uh, electrical interferences are not so common. But for instance, when you had a, an analogical TV, and you had some, some powerful uh, electrical power around, it was uh, relatively easy to see kind of bands in the in the TV. Uh, so any electrical interference, any, uh, for instance, these <coughs> half tone distortions or model patterns. So these were sets that we were looking at when we were um, when we were printing images, uh, and possible sources of uncorrelated noise. Uh, you have here, most of them are related to the camera, to the sensor that you are uh, using. So what can make uh, an observation at one point be different from the uh, nearby points? And it could be quantum noise, it could be the size of the allied grains, of the silver, silver allied grains in film photography. Can be even neural, neuronal noise in your, in your eye. And, and in general, so this source of noise, the whatever noise you get at a point is completely independent of the noise that you get in the nearby point. In this kind of noise, uh, if you have some information about what is the noise at the other point, you know how the nearby uh, noises look like, more or less, or at least some statistical properties. And here, we can uh, make a more formal distinction of that. So, you know what the correlation of an image is. So, let's say that we have the noise is, a, is an image. So, we have also an image of noise. Uh, and then we can compute what is the correlation, the output correlation of, of the noise at the large. Let's say x zero, uh, make it delta x delta y. So you know this is the expected value of the noise at the original point times the noise at x plus the lag. So this is the other correlation function. And uh, if these if this correlation, if we have uncorrelated noise, what do we get here? So we can have uncorrelated or correlated. If you have uncorrelated noise, what do you get? A delta function. Okay, the delta function. A delta, and which are the variables of the delta? X or delta X? This is the lag. They have to be the same ones, the ones that define the path. And there is a, another uh, extra term that is, and you get there in front of the delta, you get the power of the noise. The power of the 
power of the lines. And otherwise you get something else. Or if it is correlated, you get something else. But if it is uncorrelated, then you get a, a sigma square, that is the power of the noise times delta. Let's do the Fourier transform of this uncorrelated noise or correlated noise. We get if I do the Fourier transform of uncorrelated noise, what do I get? A, a uniform distribution. So I have white noise. So the power spectrum If I'm continuous here, I have to be continuous there. So, and those are vectors, and, and this amplitude is sigma squared. Uh, and if, if it is correlated, then what you get is something else. So you get something like that. Okay, so correlated is related to white noise. So when you say something is correlated or not, what you are saying is whether it is white noise or it is uh, color noise. So color is equal to correlated And why this is what you uncorrelated. So white noise is not related to be to be Gaussian or not. So typically the noises that we consider they are Gaussian white noise, but they are not related to Gaussian. So white means it is uncorrelated. Okay, so Here is our image formation model. So uh, we will have an, an ideal image and we have additive noise on top of it. And this is in real space. If you do the Fourier transform because the, the, of this equation, because the Fourier transform is a linear operator, you would have the Fourier transform of J is equal to the Fourier transform of I plus the Fourier transform of your noise. And, and here we have uh, uncorrelated noise, but with different distributions. What I mentioned before, you can have Gaussian white noise, but you can have any other kind of noise that is also uh, uh, white. So you have Gaussian white noise, and if you compute the histogram of these uh, pixels, this is what you get. And, and uniform uh, white noise, salt and pepper, white noise. So salt and pepper is a, is a kind of noise in which either you get a zero or you get one or 255 and with different probabilities. Okay, so uh, either you don't have any noise or you, you have this 255 uh, white noise or no white noise uh, pixel that is completely white. Uh, for instance, this is the noise that you get when you have dead pixels in the camera. So either it is dead or it is not dead. But uh, if it is dead, you get a zero, for instance. So it's a, uh, it can be dead in two ways. It can be dead because it always returns zero. It can be dead because it always returns 255. But, uh, and otherwise, it is not dead and it is receiving the right amount of light. And, and also another uh, remark on these histograms is that uh, this is Gaussian, and you see that it is not completely smooth here in this in this uh, gray values. And the reason is that the the perfect Gaussian is the, the expected value. It is the distribution of those pixels. This is a, a realization of a random variable. So a realization. Is taken from my perfect Gaussian, but the realization itself, the histogram, it approximates a Gaussian, but it is not a perfect Gaussian. 
okay, not the same from the uniform. Okay, so these are the images in real space. This is the correlation, or the, sorry, the distribution. And because it is uncorrelated, we already know how the, the correlation function looks like. So it looks like a delta, or very close to a delta. Uh, yeah, and if we have Gaussian white noise in the three channels, so this is how the image looks like. And here we have the histograms of each one of the channels and the histogram of the luminance, and the same for uniform. And, and you can see that the, the, the appearance of the image is rather different. If you have a Gaussian image or if you have uniform, uh, so if you have a Gaussian noise or you have uniform noise. Okay, so uh, let's take Gaussian uh, white noise. This uh, IID means uh, independent and identically distributed noise uh, or pixels. Okay, so independent means that once you know the value of one of the pixels, you don't know absolutely anything about the nearby pixels, and that is they are correlated. And identically distributed is that the distribution of a pixel is equal to the to the distribution of the of any other of the pixels in the image. And that is why we can estimate what is the underlying uh, random field uh, based on the histogram of all the pixels, because all the pixels somehow they have been taken from the same distribution, and then we can compute the histogram of those, all those pixels to estimate what was the distribution that generated it. Okay, so here uh, in our example we took uh, Gaussian with uh, 128 as mean and standard deviation of 32. Okay, so yeah, the autocorrelation. So I put it as a as an expected value, and this expected value for a particular image. So this expected, it, it is the same as with the distribution. So the distribution is a property of the collection of images. So this, this noise image, this noise image, let's say, it is distributed as a Gaussian with this mean and this variance. But this is a property that if I observe infinitely many uh, noise images, I would realize it is a two uh, Gaussian. But if I have just one, uh, the best I can, the best approximation I can have to this Gaussian is the, is the histogram. Uh, you know, the histogram, if you divide by the number of, of, of rows and columns, this should be more or less like the Gaussian generating. Okay, so this is the difference between properties of the collection and an element of that collection. So you have a set that fulfills a property, and you have an element in that set. Okay, good. So the same happens with the with the autocorrelation. This formula here, with expectation, it is a property of the set. So all the images that are generated in this way, if I compute what is the autocorrelation, then I should observe the delta. If I take one particular element of that set and I compute the autocorrelation, first the autocorrelation cannot be computed in this way, and, and second, it is not a, a pure delta. So the autocorrelation will look something more like, like this. So, so it, it will look something like this. So it will look like a, like a delta, but then I will have noise around. So it should, they should be strictly zero. But this strictly zero is a I take infinitely many of this kind of images and I average all the all the autocorrelations for each one of those. Okay, so how do we, how do I 
estimate that. So this is the expected value. So let, let's analyze this formula. So this formula is saying, you have an image. So you have an image. And you have a, a point here. And the autocorrelation is the expected value of the pixel value that you have there. And then you have another one that is x, sorry x plus delta x, y plus delta y. So you take these two pixels that are separated by delta x, delta y, and you complete the product. And if this image is uh, taken from a field that is uh, identically this, this is very important. I can take these other two points, or I can take these other two points. And I can take, in general, any pair of points, so any pair of points that has exactly the same separation. As long as they have the same separation, as this delta x, delta y, I, I can use those two points to estimate uh, what is this expectation. So that is what we are doing in this formula. So I'm going for every possible original point. Then I'm adding uh, the separation. So this is delta x, this is delta y. And then I'm computing the product between the two. And I'm adding for. And then it comes out again this problem of what happens in the in the borders so what happens if i want to compute well i, I will use the same equation so what if my blue point is here and i take that separation and i want to multiply those two what do i do at the borders and we have the traditional solutions you can periodize your image which is the, the solution that is normally taken. You can symmetrize, you can do whatever. Okay. So this phi here, or psi here, this psi is just to account for the borders, what happens at the borders. So you take all the, all the uh, points in the, in the image and you displace them by the lag. This is the plus rho plus pi, because the lag here, here has been named rho and pi. And then this psi, in general, it is the identity. So yes, you add them, and whatever it gives, it, it is your result. But what happens if, if you come out of the border of the image support? You come out of the image, you have to do something there. You can uh, set them to zero. You can, uh, or you can periodize your image. Or, for instance, you can also limit your your sum here so that you never come out of the image. That would be another possibility. The one in, in this slide is uh, psi is equal to this, and this is just periodization. Okay, good. So, yeah, this is how the power spectrum looks like. Um, and here you already recognize this. Um, it should be flat, completely flat. It is not flat. We have a little noise on top of it. And the difference is it is completely flat for the set. So the expected value, you take many of these spectra and complete the average, is completely flat. So it is a flat for the for the set, but not for a particular element in that set. And so this is the, the power spectrum that this particular case has been calculated as the uh, image Fourier transform, and then you take the module square. And, and this again, uh, I have made this distinction a few times, but I think it is a very important distinction. So let's make it again. 
So the power spectrum of an image is defined as the fully transform of the autocorrelation function of that image. Okay, so the, this is power spectrum. Power spectrum density. So this is called also the PSD. And it is the Fourier transform of the outer population. But there is a story. That is that here inside, there is an expectation. And an expectation means you need to know the set. But I don't know the set. I know just one element of that set. So uh, we can approximate this by, by these uh, approaches of, of just computing the sum as we have seen in the slide. But okay. Then, if we have two cases here, so I is deterministic, deterministic means that there is no, all the set looks the same, so I take a picture of you, and if you don't move, I take another picture, another picture, they all look the same. And the other one is that I is not deterministic. It's not deterministic. Or in other words, it's one more. For instance, noise is an example of random. And it is not only noise. So for instance, you can think of an image of a pendulum, for instance, and you don't know which, uh, at which instant you will take the picture. So the, the picture of the pendulum is, is a random picture. Okay, so uh, if I is deterministic, then this is equal to Fourier transform of I. So this is Fourier transform. So you take the Fourier transform, take the modulus squared. So, but only for deterministic images. And for non-deterministic images, there is no other possibility. So you, there is nothing. So you have to compute the autocorrelation to compute the Fourier transform. Okay. okay, good. So we have computed this autocorrelate or this power spectrum as if it, it is a, a deterministic signal. And it makes sense somehow. So if you don't have any other uh, realization of that random process, this is the best you can do. That there are uh, other estimators, but they also have power revolve around the same range. So dealing with the random image as if it is a deterministic one. And, and then we do the inverse, the Fourier the inverse of the Fourier transform of this thing. So this is the power spectrum. We take the inverse of the Fourier transform of the power spectrum, and we should get the autocorrelation function because the power spectrum is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. And this we are part here comes in because uh, sometimes, because of numerical instabilities, you get uh, a, a, an autocorrelation that has imaginary part, but this imaginary part is extremely small. So it is just simply to numerical instabilities of the of the routines calculating the Fourier transform. So uh, you take the real part and get rid of these uh, imaginary, small imaginary parts. And you see what I mean. Uh, before. So you get a, something that looks like a delta, but it has some noise around. At the delta, it also does noise, but we don't know how much. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at this. Okay, so let's say that we have an ideal image, we have a, a noise image, and we can look at the two power spectra. 
the two parallel spectra, you know that the power spectrum of an image is another image, so uh, it is a two-dimensional function. But uh, we, we will take a, a slice to it, so let me see, yeah. So this is the power spectrum of the original, but we are taking a line here. So what is happening with these values? Uh, and then this is what we are representing in this, in this slide. So we have these slides, and we have the values that we observe along that line. And this is for the input image, and this is for the noise image. So the noise image looks like flat, but we know that because it is a realization of this random process, this, it doesn't need to be completely flat. OK, so then uh, if we superpose both, so if we construct an image that is the ideal plus the noise, then the two spectra Actually, this is a, another interesting result. So, let's say that you have uh, an, image, uh, an image formation model. This is called the image formation model. But how the images are forming your system. So, let's say that this is the ideal. This is idea, this is noise, and this is what you observe. So, if this is your image formation model, then this also holds. So, if you add two images, the two power spectra are also added. But this is true only if. I and N are independent of each other. Are independent of each other. So if they are independent of each other, the two power spectra they also are. Okay, so this is what we are seeing here. So we will add the blue spectrum that is coming from the noise to the red spectrum that is coming from the signal. And what we notice is that there are frequencies at which we have more power coming from the noise. And there are some other frequencies where we have more power coming from the signal. And you may remember, I think we, we made this comment, that for most natural images, this power spectrum of the signal is proportional to uh, the frequency squared. So it, it, it decays like this. And this is slope here. So this is omega. And this is the spectrum. So it decays as the, the frequency squared. So this is true for most natural images. Oh, approximately, it doesn't need to be exactly two, but more or less around two. And you see that this is what is happening here. So we have at low frequencies, we have more in, more power coming from the signal. And at high frequencies, because the noise is, is flat, so the signal decays with the frequency squared, but the noise does not. So at some point, the noise will overcome the, the signal. And we have some, we have more noise, or more power coming from noise than from signal. And this is just a, a one d representation of what is happening in one of the lines. So we have this line here. We have analyzed that line, but uh, but in general we can analyze the power spectrum in two dimensions. So this is the original image, and this is the noise image. And and here you see this this effect that at high frequency 
there was some, some damages coming from these uh, edges. So the, the original image had a lot of edges. So edge means uh, high frequency details. So we had a, for some particular frequencies like this one, we had a lot of power. But a lot of power that was not enough to overcome the power that is coming from the noise. That is why in the noisy image, I don't, I don't see this edge in the Fourier space. And here we are representing points for which we have uh, more noise than power, than signal, sorry. So we have, in these blue points, we have more noise than signal. In these red points, we have more signal than noise. And in general, we will have a mixture. Too. So we have some frequencies at which we have more signal, and some other frequencies where we have more noise. And here you have another example. So this is the original, this is the noise image, and this is the image plus noise. And you can analyze the three power spectra and, and highlight those points where you have more signal than noise. And generally, they are always at low frequency. So, uh, a, a, a suitable way to get rid of noise is by a low pass filter. Because we know that at low frequencies, generally, we have more power coming from the signal than power coming from the noise. So if you do a low pass filter and you keep only these uh, Fourier coefficients that lie in this region, then you are more likely to, to get pixels, Fourier pixels, that have more, more power coming from the signal than power coming from the noise. So you can fix what is this uh, cutoff of your low pass, uh, your low pass uh, frequency filter. And, and then those uh, within this region, they, the, the coefficients in this region, they pass, the rest you set to zero. And uh, you get rid of the noise. This is uh, it, it is much less noisy than the original image. And, uh, oh, it is the next one. You can you may remind. Yeah. So it has less noise than this one, but we have paid a price. That is getting rid of the high frequency components. The high frequency components are the ones giving you the sharp edges. And then this, you have lost the sharp edges, and, and then your image becomes uh, blurred. So the, the edges are not smooth anymore, are not sharp anymore. And the same with this one. OK, so let's say that you knew exactly at which coefficients, at exactly at which frequencies, you have more power coming from the signal than more power coming from the noise. Because this is a simulated ex experiment. So in these examples, we have simulated the process of image acquisition. So we know exactly which was the original image, which was the noise image. So we can compute exactly at which frequencies we have more signal than noise. So let's say that you uh, design a Fourier filter that is one in the red area and it is zero in the blue area. So you are keeping all these high frequency components. And so this is your your filter, the shape of the filter, and this is what you get. And and actually this is the best filter you can ever construct. Not best, but yeah, but well, somehow it is the, the best you could construct, and, and it is keeping all the coefficients in Fourier space for which you know you have more power coming from the signal. And now you are recovering the sharp edges again. The problem with in, in real life images is that you never know what, what are those coefficients where, where you have more power coming from the noise or from the signal. 
So yeah, this is just a comparison of the two. So this is the low pass filter, the standard low pass filter. And this is the one where we are masking those three components that have more power coming from the noise. Any question up to here? No? Okay, so let's uh, let's complicate a bit more the the image formation model. So now the image the image formation model before was ideal image plus noise. Now we will have ideal image convolved with something plus noise. So this something is the point spread function. Uh, you already know about it. And and it has to do with uh, with the optics of the camera that uh, you're using or the device that you're using to acquire your images. And you know what a convolution does. So a convolution is simply uh, blurring uh, your image. Well, it depends on what is the kernel, but for standard kernels, this is a blurring. Uh, so it is, they have kind of low-pass filter uh, uh, shape. Okay, so this is our model now. So we have an ideal image. It is convolved with a, a low-pass filter. So it is something like kind of Gaussian there. Uh, and then this is the convolution of the two. And then we are adding noise. And what we observe is the final result. So what we will try now is from the final result to recover the original one, the input one. Okay, so if you do the fully transform of this equation here, so this equation here is J is equal to I convolved with H plus N. So if you do the fully transform, what you have is that the fully transform of J is the multiplication of the fully transform of I times the fully transform of H. So the convolution becomes a, a multiplication in Fourier space plus N. Okay, so and, and we can have at the whole we can have a look at the whole process, but now in Fourier space. So we have the Fourier transform of I, but this uh, there is a mistake here. So this is the Fourier transform of H, and, and then they are both multiplied. This is what we have here, and then we are adding noise. Okay, so let's see if we can recover. If we can recover I, the ideal image, from the observed image. Okay, so uh, let's let's uh, rewrite this observed image in the following way. So instead of instead of uh, I times H plus N, I times H, we will call it K. So we have first the filter. And then once we have the filter, we add the nodes. Okay, so let's try to define a filter W that removes the noise as much as possible. Okay, so we try to recover K. So this K tilde will be a recovery of K, the one that has been filtered. So we take the observed image multiply by some filter that we have to, to, de to design. This filter, this recovery filter, is called W, because we will see a technique that is called Wiener filter. Uh, I think it is there was a, a guy who was written like this. So we will call the recovery filter W. And then once you have a, an approximation of K, then you will divide by H to recover an approximation of Y. Okay, so now my estimate of I will be my recovery filter times k, that is the observation, divided by h. So my my full recovery is w divided by h. Okay, and I want to be my recovered image as smooth as possible. 
So as good as possible means I want my recovered image to be as close as possible to the idea. And as close as possible, this is in Fourier space. So in Fourier space, as close as possible could be, could be measured by, this is a complex number. So I want the module of these complex numbers to be as close to zero as possible. So I compute the module, I square them, and, and this has to do with the, with the square distances that uh, you already know, for instance, these uh, least squares that we have seen along the course. So, and, and you want these two numbers to be very close for all frequencies. That is why you integrate over all frequencies. Okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, find the W. So I'll give you first the solution. We will see later how this is, uh, how this is obtained. And actually, we will not see the derivation of the of the linear picture in much detail. But uh, the solution is this one. Okay, so let's uh, let us write it. I so. So the solution is that the W in Fourier space, this one in Fourier space, is a I and then divide it by all these are full intentions. This one. Okay, so this is the, the solution. So it involves somehow the input image, the noise, and the, the and the uh, point spread function. Yeah, this this is a, a field that we cannot define because uh, it requires to know what is I and what is M. So in this way, it cannot be designed. Let's see if we can manipulate this too. So have something that we can design. Okay, so let's divide on both uh, sides by uh, i squared. So if I divide in both sides by i squared, this is 8, and then we have 8 plus n. But this is the power spectrum of the noise, and this is the power spectrum of my signal. So I have the ratio between two power spectra. So this is equal. This is equal to eight. So it only requires two things from your system. So you need to know your system. So you need to know how your optical device is degrading the images. And the other one, you need to know what is the spectral signal-to-noise ratio. So what is the signal-to-noise ratio at every frequency? So you don't need to know what is the ideal and the noise. But you need to know what is the ratio. And this is something that normally you have characterized relatively well in your system. So once you buy an, an optical device or any uh, imaging device, uh, you need to know what is the amount of noise that it is uh, putting at every frequency. And there are ways to characterize that. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, so all these are different uh, different expressions. So the, the main one is, is this one. This is the main one. All the rest is okay, so what happens if I multiply the recovery filter by my observation and then I follow but this is not so much. And how we came to this, uh, again, we will not see the, the detail, but uh, because it, if you start from the, from the beginning, we wanted to have W, the recovery filter, that minimize this quantity. This is the power of the noise, right? Because this is the power spectrum of my, of, this is the power spectrum of the noise of my recovery. So this is the difference between the ground truth and my recovery. And the difference between the two is that noise. And then that noise in modulus squared in Fourier space, that is the, the power spectrum of the noise. So what I want to have is minimum power of my nodes. But I don't know what is I. So how can I come to that? OK, so the, the trick is to realize that you don't need I. You can express I as, as some other things that you have in your system. In your system, you have other images like K here, so K is the, fil the ideal filter image, and then you have J, that J was K plus N. So you can express this, so you can express this I that you needed in your original formulation as a function of K and J and these things. And then once you have something that doesn't depend on I, you can compute the derivative. Here it is not shown the derivative. So, but you can compute the derivative of this formula with respect to W. And again, this these derivatives they require derivatives of complex functions. These are complex value functions, and you are not so familiar with those, and that is why we will not <coughs> get into those details. But the important trick is is this one. You don't need I. All you need is to express i as a function of some other things that you have in your your model. Okay, so yeah, so let's see some results of this. For we day. What is it? Well, when you have some practice.